Hi, welcome to week 15 of Mission Diane Watch Santa Barbara. Hello. We have finished episode 71, which originally aired on the 5th of November, 1984. Mm -hmm. In Nice, Santana is playing with Brandon, and she calls him my little boy, mm -hmm. which Brandon finds a bit odd. He says, I'm not your little boy, I'm mom's little boy. Big mistake. Yeah, so Santana freaks out at having done that and uh, sends him home and tells Gina and Brandon that she's not feeling well. She's just going to stay in. Mm -hmm. But who should show up but Mason Capwell? With a very bad French accent. So he had some gifts uh, in his hand and then he comes out with the necklace. Mm -hmm. And um, Santana decides it might be best to get him out of the hotel. I think maybe she doesn't want him meeting Gina and Brandon. So she says, um, uh, oh, I want to go out and get some air. So mm -hmm. they go out and they actually spend quite a long time out and they apparently eat a lot and then come back to the hotel. So they It had... sounds like they had a really nice time, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Santana says she's been rethinking some things in her life. So mm -hmm. I don't know. Maybe she's decided Mason's the potential love match after all. Maybe. Um, it, I, I thought it was interesting, um, and of course the scene goes on a little more, but that uh, she gave up sort of, she just sort of folded when Brandon, when she realized she'd made a mistake and Brandon sort of almost reacted in, in horror to the idea that she would be calling him her little boy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that just seemed to completely throw her. And we haven't really seen um, Santana thrown like that before. Mm -hmm. And and uh, I was I guess I was a little surprised that you know usually she sort of puffs herself up and and gets on with it, but this this literally sent her to her bed, mm -hmm. and she just sort of sends him away to go back across the hallway. I mean, she's just been kind of riding this whole thing mm -hmm. on this trip. I don't think she has anything in mind, just hanging out with Brandon yeah, as much yeah. as she can. So she's been kind of riding on a wave of mm -hmm. really having a good time. Mm -hmm. Back in Santa Barbara, Ginger wants to know why Peter wants to kill Joe. He sa She says even if he's dead, Kelly might not want him back. No, yeah. might want you back, Peter. Um, and then she wonders how Kelly could love a man who killed her brother. And Peter says, I know for a fact that he didn't do it. Which makes me think that maybe Peter did it. Or knows He's who did it. He's been around a long time. He's got a pretty unsavory record, as far as we know, and we've seen what he's capable of. We know he's the one who told Channing that Joe and Kelly were going to elope. Mm -hmm. So he clearly was around the family back then. That's right. So this is very intriguing. So, I mean, how else could he know that it wasn't Joe? What are the if he could know if he himself was the killer? Mm -hmm. If he saw who the real killer is and has been covering up all this time. Yeah. Or if he actually saw Joe in a different location uh, when, when the killing happened. Or um, if he knows you know, the real knows, killer. Knows Joe couldn't have been there. Or if he knows the real killer. Yeah, you know, if the real killer mm -hmm. confided in him, for example. Now, of our current cast of characters, is there anyone who could have confided in Peter? I mean, only, the only one that comes up is Augusta, and I don't think it was Augusta. No. He's not really friends with anyone else outside of the N no. Capwell family. No, I mean, apparently he has lots of, you know... Friends, like, I mean, you know, we remember in the first week or so, he was getting all sorts of young girls visiting him, but mm -hmm. we don't know anything about any of his relationships outside of the, the cast. Maybe Mr. Bottoms is the killer. <laughs> he knows C.C. Capwell personally. <laughs> There's a, a line of uh, reasoning that we haven't thought of before. But it is definitely, I mean, given... Peter's shady behavior and all that we know of him, it is certainly not inconceivable that he would be the real killer and would have been happy to let Joe 
you know, rot in prison for however long if it meant he could get a shot at Kelly mm -hmm. and the Capitol Fortune. Yeah, we've really seen him this week. This last two days really just go off the rails and, you know, he's yeah. definitely fine to kill Joe and gets a gun, so... Yeah, we've seen how unhinged he can be as well. I mean, apart mm -hmm. from, you know, being very scheming and very ruthless and all of these things, we've also seen him really go off off the rails, as mm -hmm. you say. Yeah. He's, uh, he's a candidate for Kelly's Psycho Gazebo, oh, which big, is our segment that we started. Very strong candidate, We I introduced think. last week, where uh, Ginger Jones was the first... Uh, recipient of that award, I guess. Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. uh, over the years, as psychos show up on the show, uh, we will put them in the gazebo and see if we can fill it. Mm -hmm. um, so Peter uh, goes uh, to, I want to call it Sally's apartment, but I guess it's now Kelly's apartment, and spies on the door, and he sees Kelly and Joe in his old man disguise. Mm -hmm. um, uh, he knocks on the door, and Joe quickly hides, and then he does this thing where he tries to head up, you know, head off bad information by saying, oh, I've been thinking, you know, when I was a young man, I did some things that that were I'm really not proud of, and, you know, tries to pretend he's the one introducing the, the topic when mm -hmm. he knows, Kelly mm -hmm. already knows everything about his past. So. Yeah. Um, Kelly keeps telling him she doesn't want to hear it. <laughs> Warren uh, mentions to Summer his plans to help dive the Amanda Lockridge. Mm -hmm. So here's something about the family business that he is excited about. Cause well, this is right up Warren's alley. Mm -hmm. He likes to scuba dive, we know. So. Uh, Cruz tells Cece that his seismic detectors have detected some activity. Uh, it's in an area where he thinks there may be a lot of oil, and the figures... Uh, uh, seem to bear that out, mm -hmm. um, but Cruz is also concerned there may be uh, earthquakes coming, which could disrupt the oil, and uh, he's going to contact the university's seismology lab to see if they have any mm -hmm. any uh, suggestions um, or corroboration. Yeah. Um, Lionel gets out of bed in the middle of the night and starts having flashbacks of himself trying to convince Sophia to be with him. Yes. And this is, uh, I think she's in that white swimsuit in this flashback. Uh, don't know if it was Marcy Walker playing Sophia anymore, uh, body-wise anyway, because mm -hmm. we just saw her from behind. Mm -hmm. But definitely a new actress is doing the voice of Sophia. Mm -hmm. And we're starting to learn now a little bit more. Uh, we learn in this scene and um, also subsequently a little bit more about Sophia's death and how it happened. And it does seem like Lionel was present for that. Mm -hmm. So yeah. this explains a lot. If he was having a relationship with her, which it definitely appears that he was, and was there for her death, this this is now starting to explain his connection with her mm -hmm. a little bit more. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, the um, swimsuit and swim mask that Dominic, you know, planted for Lionel to find. Mm -hmm. uh, clearly, Dominic knows about this connection mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. between Lionel and Sophia and Lionel and Sophia's death. Augusta notices Lionel's up and tries to get him to make love to her in bed, but mm -hmm. he cannot. Um, so they have a lot of witty banter around that problem of Lionel's. Yes, yes. Um, and eventually, with Augusta climbing all over him, he appears to uh, he appears to get over his problem. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Augusta shouts, you're making the earth move for me. <laughs> but that's not Lionel, that's the earthquake! Earthquake! So we get the earthquake that was teased earlier in the episode by Cruz. Callie and Peter feel the quake, and Callie's really Actually, quite frightened by it. She's, uh, I guess, she's very um, um, what's the word? Unsettled by the idea of earthquakes. Anxious. Um, and Peter 
asks her about Dominic, because, you know, he wants to really help mm -hmm. find Joe's killer. Yeah, right. So, um, Kelly says, oh, you know, Dominic's, you know, wanted or something, and that's why he couldn't come forward. And he's not mm -hmm. very stable, and mm -hmm. he, he's mm -hmm. very weird. He just contacts us by leaving voice messages or notes. And then Peter wants to see one of the notes, and she shows it to him. And so he gets a sense of the style of Dominic's handwriting and how Dominic signs the notes. Mm -hmm. And then he leaves and immediately writes a note in the same style, uh, saying to come to the warehouse. Mm -hmm. So I think he is, this is his lure for, for getting Joe to come to a warehouse. So I think he's going to probably wait till Kelly's not around so that only yes. no only Joe finds the note um, so he can make sure Kelly doesn't you know walk in instead mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and then Peter watches as Kelly leaves and then Joe in his disguise leave mm -hmm. Dominic feels the earthquake and uh, Dominic is writing a note to Lionel to come to the cemetery so there's a lot of notes being written in this episode mm -hmm. yeah this is uh, Always a potential for for weird things when multiple notes are being written. Mm -hmm. um, Kelly and Joe arrive at Dominic's, and Peter is watching them. And when he sees Dominic's face, he has a flashback to seeing Ooh, Dominic. Looks familiar, yes. I'm assuming that flashback is to 1979. Mm. And he says, my God, Dominic is the alibi. So he knows Dominic. He definitely, yeah, has run into Dominic sometime in the past. I think we're going to find that Peter Flint was doing a lot of stuff that night of the murder that we have not seen in any of the flashbacks. I think so, too. I think he was probably wandering all over that house. I think doing so. Doing stuff. I think we've got, we're going to have more pieces put together because we already know Lionel was there. We mm -hmm. already know Warren is there. Probably Augusta wasn't. Yeah. Um... But we haven't seen any flashbacks of where they were, who they mm -hmm. interacted with it, mm -hmm. where were they near, where the murder was, were they hiding somewhere. So now we have a third person in the house uh, that uh, we don't know the whereabouts of. So I think it'll be interesting to see how all these pieces fit together around the one thing that we've seen of Joe mm -hmm. and Dominic mm -hmm. uh, finding Channing's body. I also um, will be interested um, to see what happens. Like, when Peter came to see Kelly, and he's trying to convince her that he really still wants to find the real cal killer, you know, he, and he's trying to convince her to confide in him. Um, and Joe, of course, is listening in the other room and is absolutely horrified that, that Kelly might actually be trusting Peter. Mm -hmm. And then afterwards... He he kind of confronts Kelly, Joe does. And Joe says, you know, why are you doing this? I really don't think you sh should trust him. And Kelly says to him, don't worry, I know what I'm doing. And I'm, I'm wondering if she's going to plant some false information with Peter or something like that. I found it interesting uh, for the last few weeks how easily and convincingly Kelly lies. Yeah, she, yeah. Robin Wright does not overact no. when Kelly is lying. Like yeah. any watch Days of Our Lives Now and anytime yeah. someone has a secret, they they overact it so much that anyone can yeah. tell. But she Kelly just lies with a straight face. Yeah. Um unapologetically and I can see why Joe wasn't sure whether she believed Peter or not. Yeah. Because we've seen Yeah. We've seen her do that several times uh, lately, just flat out lie to someone. Yeah. Um, and it's totally believable. Yeah. So I'm I'm interested to see how that plays out. Um, you know, because I, I do think Kelly is a factor in this. Or potentially. Yeah. Cruz feels the earthquake. And the seismologist from the university comes to visit and says that Cruz's Cruise, readings match his. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they talk a little bit about the potential meanings of these seismic disturbances. But he does say that he does know one thing. Within the next decade, they're going to have a big one. Mm. Uh, at least an eight. 
So this prompted me to do a bit of research on yeah. California <laughs> earthquakes, starting with 84 onward. Um, now, it looks like California is broken up into different zones for the purposes of reporting earthquakes. And uh, L.A. is one zone, and Santa Barbara is in the Central Coast Zone. Mm. So Santa Barbara has only had one earthquake on the list in December 2003, a 6.6. Mm. Uh, L.A. had the October 87 one. I think that was the big one that mm -hmm. everyone um, felt. That was a 5.9. 1990, a 5.7. And in 1991, a 5.6. So really, 5.9 and 6.6 .6 are the two highest ones that, that have been felt in L.A. or Santa Barbara since then. So so Santa Barbara, the TV show's postulation of an 8 is uh, did not match reality. I thought it would have uh, been a nice synchronicity if it had turned out that within 10 years there actually had been a quake. I, now, I don't know really at all how earthquakes are graded and what makes one a five and what makes one a six. And, you know, certainly there's there's all sorts of folks out there who know exactly the criteria for that. But I would imagine that uh, the severity of a quake is not just how much the earth shakes or the damage done in geological terms, but also if you, uh, you know, the if you happen to have a big city or a lot of people nearby. So I imagine you could have a very violent quake in the middle of nowhere mm. and a much less violent quake, which shakes a city, maybe a city not very well uh, built to withstand earthquakes and, and have much more damage. Mm -hmm. It could even have, uh, be related to which direction uh, the waves are coming from because, mm -hmm. you know, there may be an instability if the waves come in a certain direction. And I think there's different types, too. Uh, some where tectonic plates are sliding under each other, and some where they're pulling apart. So I, I imagine all of that plays a role. But they certainly didn't get into that um, extent of detail in their projected 8.0 earthquake. I guess we're rooting for C.C. Capwell, the oil baron, to find a lot of oil. I don't know if we are or not, but I guess, um, yeah, it, that seems to be what, uh, what we're supposed to be doing. In most fiction, the oil guy's the one people are supposed to be rooting against, but this is the main lead character of our show. Well, it's kind of like Dallas. They're all oil barons, well, right? that's true. That's true. They probably this is the C. C. same Capra era as Dallas between, and Dynasty as well. I think they were involved in oil. So Warren returns from his dive and has the bad news that the wreck shifted, and that might have mm -hmm. been uh, due to the quake. So you can just see Lionel, just you know, it's so frustrating because if he had just gotten to that, you know, sunken ship a day or two earlier if it was indeed the quake that caused it to shift, mm -hmm. it would have been free and clear. But now it's going to be a, a much more complex job. He says, talks about how he should have just paid a fortune to have it hauled up to the surface. So, uh, Lionel, Lionel tells Warren not to tell anyone that the ship has shifted, uh, even Augusta. Mm. So that's interesting. Mm -hmm. And then they talk about uh, the subject that they kind of dropped recently. Lionel asks why he blames him for the problem, the issue with the gold coins. Mm -hmm. And uh, Warren's still pretty reticent, but Lionel quickly puts all together that, that Warren realizes, uh, or he realizes that Warren knows about Sophia mm -hmm. and Lionel. And that he stole all those things to hide the affair because uh, those coins were given to Sophia by Lionel. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, that's actually some clarity amongst his very adult day. Um, I'm wondering if Dominic is drug, drug, drugging him somehow. Um, he's still adult about uh, Sophia. And uh, Warren just tells him to lay off the scotch. Uh, and then he gets the letter that we saw Dominic writing earlier. And he uh, he says, oh, I'm late to meet Sophia. I mean, mm -hmm. Eden. Sophia's dead. I've got to remember that. God, I hope this is a dream. 
Well, you know, that would actually explain a lot of Lionel's recent behavior over the last um, week or so. Um, the fact that he does keep seeing Eden and treat her like Sophia and then every once in a while he remembers it's Eden and the whole thing would actually be well explained by some sort of hallucinogenic drug or something. Mm -hmm. And that scotch that he's been drinking the yeah. last few episodes. Yeah. I don't remember if he ever got that as a gift or anything from anyone. So I don't remember, but... but if, Dominic obviously has been sneaking into the house to exactly, hide masks and things. So. Exactly. And if Dominic is Sophia, she would know that he likes his scotch. Maybe he's the only one who drinks mm -hmm. scotch. So... Mm -hmm. She would know that that would be the thing to, to drug if that's what she's doing. Yeah. Dominic must have sneaked past Minx once or twice to get into the house. Mm hmm Well, now with Brick there, it's a bit, might be a bit more dangerous to sneak into that house. Joe thinks that Lionel gave Sophia the coins. So, Joe's come to the same conclusion based on the research he was doing on was it insurance or something? I forget exactly how mm -hmm. they were tracking the coins somehow or tracing the coins' history. Um, and then Joe asked Dominic if uh, if she'd ever read Sophia's obituary, and Dominic says, "No, not really." And so Joe says that she was in a speedboat mm -hmm. and that people saw her fall overboard, and then the boat went out of control and started just going around in circles. And then the people who had witnessed her going over searched for her, but they couldn't find her. Mm -hmm. Lionel then goes to the graveyard, and uh, we see a there, there's a bouquet on Sophia's grave already when Lionel shows up, and then a woman in a I think it looked like a shiny gold dress comes running by, mm -hmm. and then uh, Lionel's talking to I don't know the spirits or something. He shouts, "Come out, whoever you are! You're trying to drive me mad!" Mm -hmm. And why do people bury empty coffins? So yeah. this is a reference to Sophia being lost at sea, I guess, and never really found. So, where are you now, he says. At the bottom of the sea, my poor Sophia. And then the woman in the gold dress uh, from across the cemetery calls, Lionel, Lionel. Mm -hmm. And it's the same voice we heard in the flashback to uh, young Sophia and Lionel. Mm-hmm. And definitely, as I was watching this and he was saying, where are you now? I was thinking, well, probably in a hotel room with a fake beard on. <laughs> it just seems, it just, I keep, I think it, every, every scene I see, I, I keep thinking it's more and more likely that Dominic and Sophia are the same person. But um, uh, it'll, it'll be really interesting to see if they are. And if not, who Dominic is? Mm -hmm. We still had, still had a potential that it could be Pamela. We, yeah. We don't think it's Eden anymore. No, no. I. Yeah, we have no idea where Pamela is. We know she's in Santa Barbara somewhere. She apparently, maybe sometimes leads a less than stellar life. But we don't know much else about her. So at the end of uh, Santana and Mason's day, they do meet Gina and mm -hmm. Brandon. And I'm trying to remember, is this the first scene that Mason's actually had with Gina? I feel like it is because Gina did show up at Cece's birthday party, but Cece just ushered her into a private room. Yeah, and I don't think Mason ever showed up at the presidential, presidential suite. suite when he went there to check for the bug that one time. Mm-hmm. And then I don't recall if he ever... Yeah, so this might be the first on-screen meeting of Gina and Mason. Now, Gina, I thought... I mean, she knew who Mason was, so they obviously mm -hmm. know each other. Yeah. Yeah. Clearly, yeah, as family friends, they do know each other. But and this I, is the I first time we've seen the two of them. Gina the was a little together. bit... I, I wouldn't say... I wouldn't go so far as to say flirty with Mason. But I, I did think she you know, seemed kind of a little bit interested in him, maybe. What did you think? I think so. I yeah. Think so. yeah. Yeah, I mean, she's just recently told Santana she's she hadn't thought about anyone since Stockman died, but that 
yesterday she was kind of like having fun. Mm-hmm. You know? mm-hmm. So maybe she's thinking Mason's a potential. Um, it would probably be good for Santana because it would mean Gina would stay in Santa Barbara rather mm-hmm. than going back to L.A. perhaps. And uh, that would mean Brandon would be in Santa Barbara too. So maybe Gina, uh, Santana should push Gina and Mason. Yeah, because one of the things Gina has said over and over in the last couple episodes we've seen is she's talked a lot about her marriage to Stockwell? Stockman? Stockman. Stockman. And, you know, it was great, but, and it keeps coming up how old Stockman was, basically. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it was very much an older man becoming infatuated with this young woman. And, and, She sort of intimates that there were a lot of limitations for her with that Mm -hmm. relationship. So um, I would think that Gina would find it quite refreshing to be with a younger man, as Mason is definitely a younger man than Stockman was. I haven't really, despite some of the sort of scuttle button, you know, some of the sort of things that various characters have tried to intimate, like Peter, when he sold his information to Mason. I haven't gotten a sense that Gina's really interested in dating an older man again, like C.C. Mm. Yeah, I mean, she's done that once, and yeah. if it was for the money, well, she has the money, so... Exactly. She doesn't actually need that. Hey, maybe Gina and Peter. Yeah. Well, and... Try to keep Peter on the show, if he... Yeah, well. He sprung back from certain doom two days ago, so no matter what he does now, he could still end up smelling like a rose. And well, and Eden show. and Peter did have that rather nice little scene a, a couple episodes ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would like Peter to stay on, if only to keep having scenes with Mason. Mm-hmm. Because yeah, those are my favorites. Really good. Yeah. The scenes with Peter and Mason and the scenes, of course, with Augusta and, and Lionel are my favorites. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, that about wraps it up for this episode. Mm-hmm. We're going to watch episode 72 and come back for another segment. Have a good night. See ya. I don't know why I said that. Welcome back to Misha and Diane Watch Santa Barbara. Hello. We've just watched episode 72. Mm-hmm. And John, the seismology professor, or I assume he's a professor, he works at the university, tells Cruz that the pressure is mounting on the faults. Yes. So that sounds very ominous. They talk about how damaging and deadly past earthquakes have been, including the famous 1925 earthquake in Santa Barbara. Mm. Uh, Cruz goes over to tell Cece about the potential of an earthquake, and Eden says he's panicking. She has a few insults for him. Yeah, I think um, this probably has less to do with the seismic readings and more to do with Eden, perhaps. Well, she has history with Cruz. And she doesn't really like him being, I think, so much of a confidant to her dad. I think she finds that undermines her, mm. her her own position a little bit. I think she's a bit annoyed that he's not that interested in her. I think that could be part of it, too. But they talk about some time they spent on the Orient Express together. Mm-hmm. And she claims to have uh, some memory problems uh, recalling that whole trip. Yeah. Uh, Santana has a nightmare mm-hmm. while she and Mason are lying on her bed after their day out, and uh, Mason comforts her. Cece clearly has a plan in place to get Gina out of Santana's clutches. Yeah. He calls Gina and claims that she needs him to come. He needs her to come back right away because there's some financial things that uh, he he needs her to deal with. Yes. And he's already booked her on the next flight home. Yeah. So Santana, you know, Gina says goodbye to Santana. And uh, while Mason's in the shower and Santana manages to get her and Mason on the same flight home. Mm -hmm. 
So Mason is confused, you know, I just got here and you haven't been here much longer. Why are we heading back already? And she says, oh, I've got some things to do. Yeah. And um, I, I think this scene was kind of interesting on a couple levels. Um, first of all, we got to see a little dream sequence, which is always kind of fun. And this was Santana running in slow motion after Brandon and being held back by CC and uh, Mason and Gina. Mm -hmm. So that's giving you very much uh, an insight into Santana's state of mind. Um, at the same time, I have to admit, I was a little sad almost that she was cutting short her trip because it seemed like she and Mason were actually having a rather nice time. Mm -hmm. And um, it just seemed like one of those choices. Um, and certainly I understand why, you know, she needs to be near her son. But it was kind of one of those choices I, I sort of thought, you know, wouldn't it have been nice if she had allowed herself to have maybe a week in in France with with Mason and maybe that would have I don't know maybe it would have helped somehow it, it would have been nice for her I thought I think uh, her, she's worried that uh, if CC gets her Gina and Brandon back there he'll immediately send them off again somewhere else and That's she won't be able true. to find them and he'll be you know even more uh, secretive about where they are Yes. So she I, actually doesn't book a flight to Santa Barbara. She books a flight to L.A. Yes. Because uh, that's where Gina and Brandon are going. That's true. Oh, yes. And I think you're very right. I think she, you know, for, from the point of view of what her quest has been for this mm -hmm. entire series, it is absolutely essential that she follows the, in their footsteps as closely mm -hmm. as possible. She can't risk, you know, thinking they're just going to go home and then a week yeah. later she could knock on their door because Cece's not going to allow that. No, no, and, and she'll lose them forever. I mean, he'll squirrel them away somewhere. But mm -hmm. still, even knowing all that, I just think it was sort of sad that she couldn't have a, a mm -hmm. little bit of time to enjoy France with Mason. Mason and Santana have some time to talk on the plane, and uh, Mason talks about how he's a much better catch than Cece, and in fact he wants to have children, and she... He sees how she has been with Brandon, and that yeah. she obviously wants kids, so that's an interesting observation on Mason's part. Yes, yes. Uh, Augusta and Warren are worried about Lionel's weird behavior. Yeah. Warren teaches Summer to scuba dive in the pool. Mm-hmm. Don't drown, says Augusta as they go <laughs> out to the back. She still doesn't really like Summer very no. much. Uh, after the scuba lesson, Warren kisses Summer, and she pulls back, which he's a bit surprised with, considering how much time they've spent together lately. Yeah, so it'll be interesting. There wasn't really much said about that, but it would be interesting to find out a little bit more about why she did that, if mm -hmm. there's some, some, something in her background or, or some history that is, um, is coming into play with that. Mm -hmm. At the cemetery, the ghost of Sophia says that Lionel killed her. Mm -hmm. He says, no, it was an accident. She says, you pushed me into the water. And he said, no, you fell. Yeah. So uh, he argues with the ghost for a while, the ghost insisting that he murdered her and him insisting it was an accident. Um, then when the ghost vanishes, Lionel thinks he's going crazy, but then he realizes, oh no, the seaweed on the on the gravestone is real. Yeah. So, um, at the State Street restaurant, Lionel's having a drink, and Dominic sits down, mm -hmm. and immediately starts in on, how well did you know Sophia Capwell? And yeah. He says, I didn't know her. And Dominic says, what about the bathing suit and the scuba mask? So, yeah. Um, it's kind of an odd tactic on Dominic's part, because, you know what? Uh, is Dominic trying to make Lionel think that the ghost of Sophia has returned? Because mm -hmm. if so, then suddenly admitting that he knows all about it might make Lionel think the whole thing is fake very quickly. So Yeah, and I think in some ways, um, apart from 
Lionel feeling like maybe his mind is going, I think that's also a possibility that's starting to occur to him as well. Mm -hmm. um, but at any rate, he's very disturbed and angry by this, and he also thinks that he recognizes Dominic. That's right, yeah. Uh, Dominic says, oh, he's going to crack very soon after Lionel leaves. Yeah. So that still makes me think that Lionel must be drugged because yeah, that's what I feel too. That's the only way this more like more. sudden interrogation might have yielded something. Yeah, because otherwise it just makes Lionel suspicious. Yeah, that Dominic is behind it all. Yeah. Eden and Augusta run into each other after the at the museum after the Peel talk. We don't actually get to meet Peel. No. And they trade a lot of insults. Yeah. A lot of insults about CC. Um, Very catty with each other. Augusta really uh, stands up for Lionel the whole time. Says, mm -hmm. oh, Lionel's much better at, at art history than this Peel guy. And I'm used to much more in depth discussions about this topic with Lionel. Now, I think we've all already had a sense, even before Eden uh, appeared on the show. That there was no love lost between her and Augusta because when we first hear of Eden, uh, it's when Augusta refers to the other Capwell sister, who's the snooty one. So obviously, mm -hmm. you know, and I mean they're neighbors and they've got all this long history between the families. So obviously they've never really hit it off, even before you know the show starts. And that's obviously playing out even more here. Lionel arrives and tells Augusta that he needs her uh, to tell him if he's going crazy. Mm. I guess he figures, you know, he thinks he's going crazy, but she can, uh, she could probably tell for sure. Mm -hmm. Then suddenly Lionel spots Eden at the museum mm -hmm. and something clicks with him. Yeah. Because he remembers seeing the woman run by and then he sees Eden. He suddenly thinks... Eden is behind all of these apparitions that uh, he's been seeing. Yeah, and, and at first, you know, this seems to be reaching a little bit. But when you think about it, this really did start happening when Eden came back home. Mm hmm And she does look a lot like Sophia. And she does look a lot like Sophia. And remember that um, Eden's arrival coincided with the Lockridges losing their beach property. Mm. So, and we already know about the animosity there. So, in some ways it does make sense for Lionel in his more lucid moments to think, well, this is some sort of a plot um, that the Capwells are running, and, and maybe Eden especially, to somehow... Um, get back at the Lockridges, or maybe even try to um, jip them out of more property or undermine them in some way. Mm -hmm. So it, it actually does make sense, because from Lionel's point of view, the timing would be very suspicious. So now, of course, he wants to speak to Eden privately. Yeah. Um, so he sends Augusta home, and she says, oh, you seem to be all right now. You were a yeah. It's going to take a few seconds ago. Um, so Augusta gets about halfway home and goes, no, I can't just leave him there. And she turns around. Yeah. Um, Lionel confronts Eden and accuses her of playing games with him. And she, at first, she thinks this is their usual back and forth conversation, but it gets more and more accusatory. And yeah. she has no idea what he's talking about. And he says, you're hiding seaweed and, and swimsuits all over the place. Yeah, he's sounding quite deranged and aggressive. Yeah, so she really has no idea what this is about. Yeah. Uh, then uh, we hear Augusta calling for Lionel, and uh, Lionel says, Oh, tell her I left, and runs away. Yeah. So Augusta shows up and says, Have you seen Lionel? And he says, I don't keep tabs on other people's husbands. Mm -hmm. And uh, they get into another big uh, argument about, you know, Lionel, and um, Augusta keeps sniping at Eden, so Eden so suddenly uh, changes tactics, and instead of saying she hasn't seen Lionel and doesn't keep tabs on him, she says, uh, he was actually here meeting another woman, that's why he sent you home, mm. and your marriage is a disaster. Yeah. 
next. So one of the things we've kind of learned about Eden, um, especially over the last week or so, is that she doesn't ever hesitate to kind of um, push in the knife and turn it a little bit when she has the mm -hmm. opportunity. So we've now seen her do this with Augusta. Um, even a, a couple episodes ago when she and Kelly were having their little dispute in the hospital when, when Kelly didn't want to go home and, you know, was not really being very keen on Peter. You know, we saw Eden do this again and we've, we've seen her do it a few times with Mason now as well and with Krups. So that seems to be part of how she, she does things. But it will be interesting to see how um, Augusta takes this and where she takes it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not a direction I was expecting um, at all. So No. One thing I did notice, having originally only seen the first few years of Santa Barbara largely on audio tape, mm -hmm. um, and only knowing, you know, the characters from the first week that I watched, and then the, the odd episodes on holidays, um, that I was really, you know, invested in the Kelly and Joe storyline, mm -hmm. and never really understood why people were so gung-ho about Cruz and Eden. Mm -hmm. But now that I'm actually seeing them, and not just hearing them, they're doing stuff in their scenes... The, the the way they look at each other... Yeah, the body language is, is really quite a basic. Like, I can see yeah. why people are obsessed with Cruz and Eden just from this these few weeks that they've been on together. Yeah, they have good chemistry, and um, you can imagine there's such a rich background to these characters. We don't really know much of their story together mm -hmm. at this point. More and more is being, you know, mentioned. You yeah. Know, this Orient Express was that the... Was that where the mission was that Cruz yeah. was on? That even you know, you know, now we're imagining them in this confined quarters of a train. Uh, obviously, they spent a summer on whatever estate Cruz was pretending to be a gardener. Yeah. Um, so was this after that summer? That'll all hopefully fall into place at some point, but. Yeah, and what was the nature of this mission? Obviously, at some point, it sounds like Eden undermined it somehow. Mm -hmm. um, just what was their dynamic? Because obviously, there's a lot of baggage left from that and a lot of feelings and emotions. Mm -hmm. You know, some of them, I think, still quite strong. Um, so, yeah, it'll be really interesting to find out a little bit more about that. And to see how that affects their relationship going forward as well. Mm hmm Yeah. I think, uh, I don't think it's going to be something that will be revealed quickly. I think no, they're no, going to take their time because yeah. there's no reason to rush No. Rush that. So I think our bigger concerns are possibly uh, the seismic issues that the possibly the whole town could be having. So. Yeah, so we'll have to see how that plays out, if this is some sort of um, foreshadowing of, of some kind of huge cataclysmic event. Mm -hmm. or Perhaps if, it's going to do some damage to the Amanda Lockridge that yeah. makes it, uh, you know, un, unrecoverable at all, which would be too bad for Lionel, because this is this big... Yeah, that's revenge a big against play. CC and getting their money back. So, also the you know another thing that was just kind of mentioned in passing, but it's not something. Well, I mean, it has several implications, I guess. But when when Cruz mentioned that, you know, he he really felt that the seismic issues warranted this. Obviously, it's going to be an expensive and and fairly. Um, Involved. He wanted upgrade. all the yeah all yeah. the valves, all the emergency valves to be upgraded. Yeah, you know what? Maybe there's some repercussions there. Maybe this is a hugely expensive thing that will, you know, impact in some way the Capwell. You know, if if they're ever short of money, maybe that's just the one thing that pushes them over. I don't mm -hmm. know. There's there's no indication of that, but 
the fact that it was mentioned as being costly and or at the very least it keeps crews very much involved in a in a very um, close relationship with CC for a long period of time while they're doing this upgrade um, and I think as we talked about just what it sets up between Eden and Cruz in relation to CC. I take this upgrade talk as just sort of, you know, random um, stuff that the writers threw in to make it look like Cruz was working on mm -hmm. something and yeah. CC was working on something. I mean, it's more realistic than, than Days of Our Lives where people are running these massive corporations and the only work they ever do is that twice a year when they have to decide who's going to be the new chairman. Yeah, exactly. And the actual business is never mentioned. So I think this is this is the writer's attempt to add some sort of realism um, to to their those jobs. So I I, I would suspect we don't hear about about that ever again but well it does though get as you say get it gives um Cruz a reason to be around mm -hmm. because when he was brought in it was to to try to quell this emergency mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so that's true he's been given why this big else would he job be here? related yeah. to oil rigs there should be some you know signposts every few days or weeks that he's doing something related yeah. to oil rigs. So. Yeah, exactly. So you're right. I, I think if, if nothing else, it gives him a reason to be there and consulting with CC and be active in cap oil industries. Mm -hmm. In a way, P Peter's job is a lot easier to depict on screen in, a, in, a, in this sort of a mm -hmm. studio-bound thing. I mean, he's... He sits at a desk with papers, and it's very easy to believe there's hotel business being done, that he's signing off on things, or that he's approving things, you know, whereas with Cruz's job, it's really, first of all, they're not going to be able to show him out on an oil rig, so they're yeah. going to have to talk about what is he doing there that's, that justifies this huge salary, so they do have to come up with some sort of major retrofit type things uh, to at least mention once in a while to indicate that Cruz is earning his money and is, you know, making changes and suggestions that are va are valuable to the company. And when you think about it, it it is actually a challenge to incorporate a character like Cruz into a show like this. Because mm -hmm. he's macho, he's a maverick, he's an adventurer. That's not the kind of character that sits around in a sort of family mm -hmm. drama very easily. Yeah. You know, he couldn't be in Peter's job. He can't be this macho, adventure-seeking hotel manager. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so this is actually a really good way to plausibly have him be in Santa Barbara for a while, but also doing the kind of work that would be relevant to who he is and what he does. Mm -hmm. It'd be interesting how they, how long they manage to sustain that yeah. with the character before maybe it falls apart and they have to do something else with him. Yeah, yeah. But for now it works and it also gives him a really good cover for his, I, I want to say espionage, but his kind of undercover work as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's another fallback role for Cruz, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for the writers to use if the oil thing just turns out to be unsustainable. But then so is that, because how much espionage is happening in Santa Barbara? Well, exactly. If this was um, if this was set in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. or, or somewhere like that, then that could be maybe carried on a, a bit more plausibly. Yeah. yeah. Um, we've, had, uh, we've had an oil rig explosion. And then there we have the seismic thing, but I mean, how much could conceivably happen in the coming years mm -hmm. that would always be just as interesting? Yeah. I think that's about does it for episode 72. Yes. And we'll be back after we've watched episode 73. See ya. Welcome back. Hello. 
We finished watching episode 73 of Santa Barbara. The original air date was November 7th, 1984. Mm -hmm. And I keep forgetting to look up the temperatures at the time in the real <laughs> Santa Barbara. Um, but it seems very summery there. Yeah, it does. Ted has booked the yacht mm -hmm. for his and Lakin's honeymoon. Yeah, this so sounds After all, Mr. Exciting. Bottoms married us. So. Uh, they are looking forward to their evening. Um, Ted, while Lincoln's getting ready, uh, Ted mentions to Lionel that Eden is, uh, you know, working in the family business and, uh, he's working on some real estate mm -hmm. and he kind of realizes immediately that, uh, he doesn't want to go any further, yeah. but Lionel keeps pushing this. Oh, some recently acquired property. Mm -hmm. Lionel, is it the beachfront property? Yeah. It could be the beachfront property, <laughs> so, um... Later, Jade checks the clothes that Lakin has packed yep. and pronounces that men are crazy about Angora. This could be very dangerous. You know, this line must have been written by someone who's never worn Angora. <laughs> because Angora is very itchy and uncomfortable in real life. Seems like more of a 1950s thing. Yeah. Uh, Lakin says she's nervous. Jade says, love conquers all, and then says, what are you going to tell Mommy Dearest? Mm-hmm. Reference, of course, to the movie mm -hmm. Mommy Dearest. Yeah. Uh, tell her you're spending the night with me. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, Danny and Ted are talking, and Danny thinks Cece will send Ted away to college, so that will force an end to the relationship with Lakin. Yeah. Now, Cruz is worried about people getting injured in a potential earthquake. He kind of has daydreams about Mm -hmm. People screaming in horror as, yeah. as things He's collapse. He's very so. worried about this potential for a uh, uh, level 8 earthquake. Mm -hmm. He goes to the Capwells and uh, run, uh, to talk to Cece. He runs into Eden first, mm -hmm. and she mentions she's going to exploit the Lockridge property, she says. Yeah. Um, he says, well, make sure whatever you build is earthquake-proof, and... He says maybe the Capwells should leave town for a while. Mm -hmm. So she says, well, I guess we could leave for 20 years, and that'll prove you right. But there's no way to know when the earthquake's going to hit. So no, exactly. So staying put. Um, he goes to see Rosa at her house, uh, and where Danny is studying, and asks if the Andrade house is earthquake-proof. Mm -hmm. So one thing he could have done, as I know from my... The safety team at work is they could have made sure that all the shelves are nailed to the walls because yes. they will fall forward mm -hmm. during an earthquake. So I guess uh, either the writers didn't know about that or that wasn't something that was being advertised as a safety thing yeah. back then. And then Danny's studying, so Cruz asks him, oh, do you know what you want to be yet? Mm -hmm. And he says, not really. And Rosa says, oh. He's known since he was five years old. He wants to be Cruz Castillo. Aww. So, um, then uh, Danny asks Cruz who his heroes are. Red, uh, he guesses Red Adair. Mm -hmm. Or no, maybe Cruz says, guess who my hero is. And he says, it's Ruben Andrade. Yeah. So. And one thing we learned during this little encounter is that Cruz's favorite subject in school was physics. Oh, I sorry, I glossed over that. I was probably typing. Yeah, so I think that indicates that, you know, maybe there's a little bit of engineering in Cruz's background, perhaps, mm -hmm. that, that does give him the qualifications to, to work on an oil rig and to do the kind of, of work he's doing for mm -hmm. CC. Maybe he's got some knowledge about structural integrity and stuff. Yeah, in yeah. Parks. So... As Rosa said, oh, the house has been here a long time, but mm -hmm. says, I bet it hasn't been in a major quake. So yeah, yeah. I guess that 1925 quake would be the, the last one. But that gives us a, a, just a tiny bit more insight into Cruz's skill set, I think. Mm-hmm. Seems to have a lot of skills. Um, they do, at one point during the Cruz and Eden discussion, uh, Cruz says something like, uh, she knows all his secrets, and he knows hers or something like yeah that, they so. well yeah they they know that i i'm assuming they both have a certain number of skeletons in their closet mm -hmm. i i don't know what cruz's secret could be but i think i i think i remember what eden's is mm. it might take a few years for that to come out though all right i don't have well, any memory of the timeline 
Peter is working on his forgeries from Dominic mm -hmm. while Ginger watches, and Ginger says Joe is worth more alive than dead. Yeah. So she's trying to talk Peter out of this, and Peter says, no, I've got it all figured out. I found a remote spot in a wildlife refuge where his body will be picked clean by animals within days. You know, just this little remark, and I guess we're we're not necessarily going to get to see what she means by it, but uh, it kind of indicates to me that Ginger maybe has some other plans or strategies that could be, that a live Joe could be used for, mm -hmm. which, as I say, we'll probably not see, but, you know, I think... Uh, Ginger does have a, a devious mind. She's managed to stay out of jail despite having a lot of troubled things in her past. Mm -hmm. So I think if I were Peter, I, I would maybe listen to her a little more. Yeah, he's just very dead set on his plan. Yeah. Amy comes in and asks if she can leave early because mm -hmm. they're throwing a party for her parents who are getting back together. So yeah. I think we all kind That's of nice. predicted that. Mm -hmm. Uh, then Eden comes by, and she needs to talk about the beachfront property and ask mm -hmm. her about the different the variances that the that the utilities companies have, and he doesn't know. And she asks about some soil types, and he doesn't know. And then she asks some other, you know, stability related question, and she realizes he's not really paying attention because yeah. obviously he's planning to kill Joe Perkins. So. Um, she gets very upset with him, says, we've got to go over there today. And he says, oh, I'm busy this afternoon. Yeah. And she's, she keeps iterating that uh, this company business that you're on better be more important. And this company business might be the last thing you ever do here. Yeah. So, of course, it's all personal business that he's thinking about. But it did strike me that she's really the first one to put Peter through his paces like that. Mm -hmm. You know, and actually see what he knows and what's, what he can do. I mean, Mason did a little bit when he first started. And Mason, as you remember, was sitting in on all of his meetings. But, you know, in terms of, of the skills that, that Peter brings to the job he has, and I guess the job he had at Lyman, that's something we've speculated on in the past. Mm -hmm. Because certainly his his past as a male prostitute would probably not have given him a lot of training in physics or in management. So. I mean, maybe Eden will figure out that he didn't really, wasn't really qualified in physics uh, based on her yeah, discussions that's what I'm with thinking. him because she may come back to him and say, oh, I found some potential, uh, you know, issues with the soil. What kind of stability do you think this will be? Yeah. Something like that. She also says, you know, after his failure to really answer any of her questions. Oh, maybe, you know, maybe this promotion wasn't really the right thing for you. Maybe just managing a couple of hotels is the most you can handle. Yeah. So I, I'm actually seeing a few threads here. I mean, on the one hand, remember when uh, Kelly was taken to hospital after a kidnapping, you know, Eden really let into her about not being that enthused about Peter anymore. Mm -hmm. And she seemed to be you know, very, Eden seemed to be very tender towards Peter. They seemed to be developing a little bit of a rapport. Now, that seems to have changed fairly abruptly with uh, Mason pulling, you know, whatever strings he could to get Peter the VP position. And remember, Eden was keen on having that job herself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And now she's going quite hard on Peter. Mm -hmm. So I think this shows us um, a measure, first of all, of Eden's ambition, but also her seriousness about actually earning that job. So yeah. I, I think she wants to make sure Peter's worthy of that position. And I guess yeah. if she finds him failing, I'm sure she'll go to, to CC. Yeah, that'll right give away. her some ammunition, I think. So I think Peter needs to kind of watch out on that front, too. Augusta is talking to Breeze. Yes. We haven't seen Breeze for a while, no. have we? I was actually wondering recently if we'd seen the last of Breeze. And, uh, you know, you look on IMDb and see when all the actors appeared, but there's nothing for Breeze appearances. So I might have to start logging those. For I'm wondering if there's a certain, you know, in real life, if there's a certain number of dogs playing Breeze as mm. well. Maybe they did a cast change on Breeze and we didn't know. <laughs> Breeze number two. Yeah, or three, 
we don't know. They just need a plaque. My oh, dialogue was terrible. I yeah. quit the show. <laughs> Um, well, so she's coming. talking to Breeze about Eden's comment uh, that a Lionel is seeing another woman. Mm -hmm. She asks Lionel to do the circle of truth, and she asks, are you seeing another woman? And he says no. And he says, are there any young studs working on the property that you have an interest in? <laughs> and she says no. So Now, I don't, I'm not quite, I mean, their circle of truth, I guess, is sort of a bonding exercise for them, but it, it has never when we've seen it in the past, had anything remotely to do with actually telling the truth. So no, I, I strongly, sus you know, I don't think Augusta would have necessarily been suggesting this as a true way to gain any sort of um, factual information out of Lionel. No. If she was, it was pretty desperate. Yeah, I think she just wants him to lie aloud. <laughs> Well, maybe also, remember, we've seen her do this before, where she'll look at someone very carefully to try to tell if they're lying. Mm -hmm. So maybe she's just using it to to see if Lionel gives her any tells while he's lying to her. Mm -hmm. Then Lakin shows up while she's cleaning out the, the vanity cabinet uh, that we've seen recently. And... Um, Casual, casually mentions, oh, there's some flowers from Ted Capwell on, mm -hmm. in the other room. And Lincoln goes in there and the note's been torn open. It's not, it hasn't even been like surreptitiously unsealed. Yeah, it's She's very torn obvious. the end off the envelope. And she goes, what does Ted mean when he says, I'll love you tonight forever? Slow clap for Ted for giving away their plans. <laughs> so Augusta cautions her and uh, Lincoln says, There'll never be anyone but Ted. So, there probably will. As someone who's seen the next seven years, I cannot confirm or deny that. <laughs> uh, then, while I guess that's clean, she finds the white swimsuit, which I had thought was covered in blood, but yeah, maybe I was mixing it up with the flashback. Kind of I think maybe it was covered in, like, seawater that first okay. time, and, and maybe had some seaweed in it, so that might have been the discoloration, because it certainly didn't have any blood on it then. Um, Lionel shows up at the beachfront property and sees Eden there taking notes and uh, they end up talking a little bit about beachfront property and a bit, a little bit about Lionel stalking her. And <laughs> she uh, asks if he knew Sophia and he says, not really. And then she doesn't really believe that. No. She sees that. That's, you know, not quite true. So then she flat out says, uh, asks if he was her mother's lover. Mm -hmm. And he says he never answers questions like that. So that's not a no. And then she asks if he wants to become her lover. And that doesn't actually get answered. No. And, you know, it's sort of hard to tell if, she, you know, how much she's testing him or whether this would be the segue into getting a little bit more information. Um, yeah, it's sort of... And also, the other thing Eden mentions, um, I think it is during this encounter, is that she has been a little off-kilter lately, that she's getting angry with people and mm -hmm. emotional about things, uh, you know, just without very much provocation, which we've actually commented on in the last mm -hmm. few episodes. We've kind of noticed her going off the handle a little bit. We've thought about Lionel being drugged, but not being Yeah, her. yeah. But I found that, that her comment that she went to Cruz that she can't really remember what happened on the Orient Express was odd. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that was just a joke or if that actually was something. Yeah. Is there something... So there's some weird thing going on with Eden, too. Yeah, so I think there's kind of, obviously, there's there's a lot of layers to this evolving relationship between Eden and, and Lionel. And I think the other, another layer, too, is, that happened at the beginning of this episode, which we've already talked about, is when Lionel talks to Tad, and, and Tad is talking about how Eden is involved in developing the beachfront property. And I'm wondering if Lionel, since he's still suspicious of Eden for, uh, you know, somehow doing this to him, mm -hmm. you know, if he's wondering if 
maybe that beachfront property is also some sort of motive for what's happening to him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because, I mean, in the past, his thought Eden's interest might be, yeah. you know, reciprocated. But now, I think everything she says, he thinks it's a trick. He yeah. It's part of his trick. So, so I think this encounter uh, between... Lionel and Eden on the beach as the two of them kind of circling each other and trying to figure out mm -hmm. what each other is playing at. Because they're both behaving strangely, to, to mm -hmm. be honest. Mm -hmm. What they're playing at and kind of what is really going on. Okay. Lionel goes home to Augusta, who wants to make love. Yeah. She removes her robe to reveal she is wearing the white bathing suit. Yes. And says, how do you like it? Yeah. So that's, that'll be a nice opening scene in the next episode, I think. Yeah. Lionel has to try and explain several things at once. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how that evolves. And actually, one thing I should mention about um, uh, Lionel's conversation with Eden is when Eden admits to him that she told Augusta that right. that uh, he was seeing another woman. He says, why would you do that? And then that's when she says she's yeah. lashing out at things un uncharacteristically. Or something. Yeah, but I liked the way he said, he said to her after she told him, he said, well, you know, why would you do that? That, that seems unnecessarily cruel. You know, mm -hmm. I know, you know, Augusta can, can, um, set people off, but that, that seems cruel. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, when we see Joe and Kelly together today in the last uh, episode, yeah, they have a new song playing in the background. Yeah, a new song, new Joe. It's the last time I made love, it was with you. Uh, I can't remember who right now. We'll research it. And uh, so I guess they, they dumped Dane Witherspoon and they dumped Peebo Bryson at mm -hmm, the same time. Mm-hmm. John, Marissa, and Amy arrive at Sally's apartment, which is now Kelly's apartment, mm -hmm. although it's filled with Sally's things. Um, and when she opens the door to them, Kelly finds, finds the note from Peter, purported to be from Dominic, Yeah, uh, that's halfway under the door. And she and Joe read it, and it says, Back today from L.A. with great news. Meet me 3 p.m. Wildlife Refuge, 200 yards from entrance. Come alone. Mm-hmm. So Kelly finds it suspicious. Yeah. But Joe actually is pretty gung ho about going there, and uh, thinks Dominic is gonna say, that, "Oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come forward and clear you." Yeah. I don't know. It seems like a bit of a joke. But, um, so they all toast to John and Marissa being back together. There's a big banner in the background. Yeah. Uh, Jade arrives late. Um, John and Marissa say they're going on a second honeymoon. And Amy says, oh, I've got some stuff about Hawaii. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's a little bit of a sad thing. Um, he, uh, it's almost 3 o'clock, so Joe's got to leave almost immediately. He doesn't even have time to put on the disguise. Yeah. Uh, he gives Kelly the gold coin. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they specifically showed that for a reason. So yeah. I think uh, well, that's a bit of a bad sign for Joe if... He's handing off all the stuff Kelly's going to need yeah. to continue the research. Um, and after he goes, John thanks Kelly for believing in Joe. In Joe and uh, that's the reason, you know, he and, and Joe were able to reconcile. So this, you know, several of these things kind of make me feel like they're tying up loose ends for Joe. Mm -hmm. Just as he's about to walk into a, a deadly Ambush, trap. basically, yeah. Um, Peter arrives at the Los Padres Wildlife Refuge, and the sign says closed due to wildfires. Mm -hmm. So in addition to earthquakes, California's got this wildfire yeah. issue. And he finds a spot uh, where he can see the path, and uh, puts, on his, you know, puts together his rifle, puts on his gloves, and gets uh, a nice uh, Y-shaped tree that he can, that he can aim from, and waits for Joe, and Joe arrives and eventually comes into Peter's sights, and Peter says, Peter takes aim and says, Bye, Perkins. Yeah, and he's got he's got Joe's head right in his target. So 
It doesn't look good for Joe. It doesn't look good for Joe Perkins. No. Any thoughts on what might happen in the opening seconds of the next episode? Well, I don't know about the opening seconds, although I could see if a sudden noise suddenly startled Peter. He might shoot wide or something and, and Joe hides behind a rock. That might be a possibility. That would probably lead into quite a long chase scene through the yeah. wildlife reserve. And I guess if you're going to do some location shooting at a wildlife reserve, you might as well get more than a few yeah. shots out of it. Um, one thought I did have was that Ginger's against this plot. Could she somehow manage to to stop Peter before he he shoots Joe? Yeah. Or or maybe has replaced the bullets with blanks or something somehow. Mm -hmm. um, you know, all Kelly needs is, like, Dominic to phone right now to confirm that he didn't write the note. Yeah. So even if Joe does bite it, then they know it's not Dominic involved at all, and then she and Dominic could work together to figure out who might, you know, have set this up. But they could even backtrack in time a bit at the start of the next yeah. episode, have Kelly get a call from Dominic and race out there, you know, mm -hmm. and, you know, that occurred... You know, in between episodes, yeah, where you know she she gets there in time. Another thought is that earthquake starts. That would certainly throw off Peter's aim. Yeah, we'd still end up with a chase scene <laughs> through the through the uh, through the wildlife reserve. Yeah. Plus, don't forget there's wild coyotes somewhere in Santa Barbara. Yeah, that could that have been uh, spotted. So that could be a factor as well. Peter, oh, a wild coyote might bite Peter on the leg just as he's about to shoot. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've never found them to be that vicious mm -hmm. towards people in real life. They're sort of like little dogs in real life, but uh, maybe a pack of them could be quite dangerous. It's maybe. exciting to see our first location shoot since yeah near the beginning of the series, I think. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I don't know, maybe we'll have a few days of chase be, Joe being chased through the wilderness or something. Yeah, it does seem like they would want to maybe use that location a little bit now that they've committed mm -hmm. to it. It's November, so the sweeps have started, so this is probably their big sweep story. Yeah, actually. they've probably put a little more budget into this yeah. episode. I think I've seen one of the ads for this week, ah. um, and it's so spoilery that I didn't want to play it for you, so okay, we'll wait until exciting. after it's over before we play the play the advertisements because uh, they you know they like to they like to advertise what's coming up in the week yeah you know beforehand but uh, yeah I, there, were, there were several things that happened that are all crammed into the ad so mm. um Same. we'll see that later in a week or maybe even two i'm not sure how long this will go so all right we're excited to watch episode 74 so we will see you after we've done that see you later Welcome back. Hello. We finished watching episode 74 of Santa Barbara. Original air date, November 8th, 1984. Mm -hmm. John and Marissa are going on a cruise. Perhaps it's the 35th anniversary of the soap opera, These Are My Children, and they're going on a reunion cruise. Well, I don't know if that would really be very romantic for a... What what is their honeymoon? Do we even know how long they've honeymoon. been? Yeah, okay, it's, it's their a second, second honeymoon. But do we know being... how long they've been married? Yes, John mentioned it very explicitly in one episode, and I wrote it down at the time, but mm -hmm. I don't remember. Ah, it was some number of years equivalent to Joe's age, I think. Hmm. Uh, Augusta wants to know whose swimsuit it is that she's wearing. Yeah. You know, I'm, I, I, I don't really know about wearing someone else's bathing suit. No. Especially well, when it doesn't look like it's being washed. I suspect she had brick wash it, and uh, now it's clean. That's what we're going to go with, because we don't really want to contemplate. So the first yeah. thing Lionel thinks is that Augusta's the one who actually has been taunting him with yes. all these things. Yes, yes. Um, then when he realizes that's not what she's talking about, he says, oh, I've had this, uh, I've had this suit for years. 
And she said, well, most men just put a notch on their belt. Yeah. Um, then during their back and forth argument, she demands to know where she, where he was that afternoon. And he says he was just out of the beachfront mm -hmm. uh, property. Um, Augusta says, oh, is that where you meet her? <laughs> so Augusta goes to visit Eden, who happens to be in Peter's office. Yeah. And uh, Augusta demands to know if Eden made the whole thing up about Lionel and another woman and Eden um, the wolf refuses to allay Augusta's fears he, she, she says oh I was angry when I said that mm -hmm. but I don't want to engage in this conversation any further yeah Eden's a little less fiery than you know during her last encounter with Augusta but uh, she's not saying very much no so that doesn't help um, then as Augustus leaving Eden takes a phone call and she mentions uh, to whoever it is, oh, I was out at the beachfront property this afternoon taking some notes. And then Augustus suddenly thinks, oh my God, it's Eden that mm -hmm. Lionel's having an affair with. Mm -hmm. So she rushes home and she spins this tale that she's pieced together of Lionel trying to figure out the perfect revenge against C.C. and the Capwells, and that would be to date Eden. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which, of course, is not true. It's <laughs> not quite <laughs> so yet. So uh, he says, oh, yeah. well, I'll just go in the circle of truth and tell you, and then you'll know. Yeah. But she says that uh, he always lies in the circle of truth, and he says, well, you always lie in the circle of truth. Yeah, yeah. But it is showing that Augusta is thinking outside the box a little mm -hmm. bit on this. To piece together. Yeah. A portion you of know, it. She's got quite a few pieces and she hasn't, well, we don't really know how they add up either, mind you. So, but she's, she's playing with uh, some pretty important pieces here. Mm -hmm. Ted and Lakin are making their plans to go to the yacht that evening. Yeah. Uh, the gang from Nice returns and, uh, Gina, Mason, and Brandon walk in, and Cece greets them all, and Santana sneaks in behind them, and then yeah. comes around the corner. Hello, Cece! Yeah. Oh, oh uh, what are you doing here? We were all on the same plane together. Yeah. Says, what do you mean all? Says, oh, Mason joined me, too. So Then Cece says, well, how did Mason know where Gina was? And, uh, anyway, he gets all flustered by that, and he's not happy, but uh, he's actually... Uh, got something to talk to Gina about in the in the study. So uh, at this point, I was thinking, oh, he's going to tell Gina that Santana's Brandon's uh, mother, and to to not uh, yeah not let Brandon near her anymore. Uh, but when they come back, um, I guess it was just about financial stuff. Yeah. Because um, Santana, uh, she says, oh, I'm going to go to L.A. and put the house up for sale. Yeah. So then Santana says, oh, I'll watch Brandon while you're down there, and Gina says, sure. Yeah. So I think CC, CC, well, obviously was and very Cece angry about that. CC looks apoplectic over that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you know, one of the things I I found kind of amusing in this little scene is that when CC is asking Mason how he ended up joining this little crew coming back from Nice, you know, Mason's kind of got this naughty boy smirk on mm -hmm. his face, like he sneaked away without his dad knowing. And and it, it just, it's so interesting to me because if you compare that with Cruz, who's busy, you know, zipping around, trying to prevent an earthquake from destroying CeCe's oil rigs, or, or you look at Eden, who's, you know, running around with plans, trying to figure out how to best um, develop the, the Capwell properties, you know, you can see how much Mason has kind of his status has has declined a bit since since we started the show. He's gone from being a potential candidate for governor to sneaking around behind Dad's back to go to Nice. Mm -hmm. Now the phone rings as uh, Santana and Brandon and Gina go out to the car. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a friend, a friend of Cece's who uh, had, uh, is reminding them that they plan to play poker that night. Yeah. And he says, oh, let's do it on the yacht. And Ted yeah. overhears that. He goes, no, 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 you can't 
you can. You told me I can have the yacht. And yeah. See, she's just as clueless as when he was Paul Burke. Uh, yeah. Like, oh, yeah. quiet, Ted, I'm busy making plans to go on the yacht. And yeah. Like, no, you can't go on the yacht. And then, just hang on a minute. Ted wants something. And it's like he can't understand why Ted wants the yacht when he's been explicitly promised the yeah, yacht. Yeah, yeah. He says, oh, you know, business uh, trumps <laughs> pleasure. <laughs> and you're playing poker. Yeah. I do more business playing poker than most people do. So. But Ted does win him over to yeah. his point of view. He, he stands his ground. He insists that CeCe promised it to him, but he yeah. doesn't. He says, why is it so important? He goes, oh, it's just that you made a promise. I've made yeah. Arrangements. Yeah. And of course, he's looking forward to his lovely romantic evening mm -hmm. with Lincoln. Lincoln. So. Mm hmm. Let's hope they go more than two kilometers off the coast. Well, we're going to have to see how that shakes up. Yeah. Um, so, anyway, by the time Cece's finished with all this, Santana and Brandon have vanished. Mm hmm. And so we next see them at Rosa's house. Yeah. And Rosa and Brandon and, Sartan and Santana are there in the kitchen. And, of course, after all that flying back and forth, Rosa asks Brandon if he's tired, and he is. So she suggests that he have a nap in Santana's old room. Mm -hmm. And when they go up to the room, Santana takes the opportunity to book herself two tickets to Rio. Yeah, so she's. Uh, we had a little bit of foreshadowing of this. She was having a little chat with Brandon at one point and telling him all about this exciting place called the Amazon, where there's all these wonderful animals and all this adventure. And um, I think that gets him a little bit excited. And uh, you can just see the wheels turning around in Santana's mind. Mm -hmm. that this might be a place to take Brenda. Mm -hmm. That's what I surmise she's doing. I don't think she's booking it for her and Mason. No. I don't think uh, Brandon will be too happy when he gets to Rio and finds out he's been kidnapped. Yeah. Uh, Lionel tells someone, presumably the mystery person that he's yeah, been calling from time know. to time, that the shifting of the Amanda Lockridge has messed up his entire revenge plan. So this is interesting because I, I didn't really realize that the, the painting recovery and the, re and the revenge against the Capwell plan were were that linked other than the ship was involved. So hmm. that's kind of interesting. Is he hoping to find some, or plant some evidence on the ship? But if the ship is undiveable, then he can't, you know, make it seem believable that he's he's recovered some evidence against you know, Horatio Capwell or, or whoever. It seems like kind of a loopy, far-fetched plan anyway, just from what, you know, the pieces we're seeing of it. Mm -hmm. Although this is Lionel, so he does think, a little bit creatively. Um, but it does occur to me that if there is some sort of huge earthquake, maybe the ship will be sh shaken back into place. Mm -hmm. So Lionel may not have entirely lost his chance at hatching this plan. That's correct. Now Minx has Brick and Warren carry the sarcophagus up into the living room and mm -hmm. put it back up against the wall where it was for the first week or so. And uh, she tells the collected Lockridges and assorted people that she's found a buyer. Mm -hmm. And Lionel is worried that she's letting go of this artifact that he, uh, you know, he scoured the world for. And she mm -hmm. says, well, I'm going to get the going rate for monstrosities. Yeah. Uh, then Brick says, uh, gives her an ultimatum, says she's got 24 hours to tell him exactly why he's there. Mm -hmm. and she says that he'll shortly have a promotion to mm. a position that she refuses to name, uh, and that uh, she'll pay for his law school within the next two years. Mm. Um, so he, she hasn't actually answered any of his questions, no. and he thinks, this is just another test, isn't it? And yeah. After he leaves, she says, oh, I think you're going to pass. Yes, and I, I really like this scene. I like any scene with Minx in it. Mm -hmm. And we got to hear her little pop, 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 pop again. <laughs> yeah. And we got to hear Bricks do it back to her. So that was just fun. Mm -hmm. Kelly asks Mason. Kelly's a very duplicitous. Yeah. Kelly asks Mason to drop the cocaine charges against Joe. I mean, well, he's, he's dead. dead after all. And yeah. they were probably planted by someone. Yeah. Which Mason can't really deny since it was under his orders. Mm -hmm. So Mason says, yeah, I'll, I'll set that in motion, but it could take some time. Yeah. 
Um, then Warren shows up and says, oh, here you have my coin. And uh, She says, yeah, I have it here, and I'm not going to give it to you. And then she kind of snaps and says, because you stole this coin for us, from us, as well as all the other coins, and you killed my brother. Yeah. So then Warren grabs the coin from her, and it looks like he's about to hit Kelly when uh, Ted grabs his arm. And then Warren just uh, escapes from, from the place, and um, Ted goes after him. Yes. So and we've got, that's how we left things, was Warren on the run with Ted, Ted running after him. And I, I just feel like that whole scenario isn't necessarily going to have a great ending, because we've already seen a little scene earlier where Ted and Warren were trying to um, calm some horses, I believe, mm -hmm. at the Lockridge house. This was quite early on in the, the episode. And Warren was talking about the horses being upset for some reason. I seem to remember, you know, hearing on the news some sort of report somewhere, or reading an article somewhere that animals often get a little bit upset before a natural disaster. So that might be foreshadowing mm -hmm. of our if earthquake. They are somehow able to sense that. And also it was mentioned the coyotes being out there too. So we've got two potential dangers. But also, you know, um, in a in a non physically life threatening way, I wonder if this could have some sort of negative impact on Ted and and Lakin's relationship. If you know she mm -hmm. sees him trying to pry this coin out of Warren's hand, and if the two of them are are having a big fight, and she come comes across them. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, I mean. Can imagine seeing Warren hurtling that uh, barbed wire fence in the in the, the beginning of the next episode, and Ted chasing after him. Yeah, something like that. I mean, we've just had such a build up to this wonderful romantic evening on the yacht, where they're finally going to, mm -hmm. you know, consummate their love. And it would it would be typical of a soap opera, I think, to kind of throw a few wrenches in that along the way. That's true. There are a couple Especially of potential problems in, yeah. this, in this episode alone. So. Yeah. Now, scientist John, not John Perkins, different John, uh, tells Cruz that, uh, you know, all the, the data seems troubling and that the increased oil seepage is, is a known sign of a, a potential impending earthquake. Mm -hmm. So this makes uh, Cruz a little more worried. He says, oh, I'm going to take all this stuff out to sea just to be safe. Yeah. And scientist John says, well, make sure you go out at least two miles because uh, uh, the tsunami will will swamp every, anything yeah. you know, closer than that. So then uh, we see Cruz uh, bringing the figures to CC and saying, you know, I think we should just shut everything down for the next yeah. week. And CC says, you know how much that will cost? Yeah, that would be. And Cruz says, well, you know, it's better than costing lives. Yeah. So we'll see if CC's willing to shut down all his oil rigs. They probably lost. Did they lose any people in that last I don't oil know. rig explosion? Maybe not. Maybe but everyone got out. Yeah, of I think now. everyone got out actually. So that was that was lucky. Then. I guess what one scenario I could see happening is maybe if there's a a little bit of quaking that you know maybe. It seems like crews might have some sort of an emergency plan for blocking for blocking these things off quickly, but I don't know how doable that is. Like how long that process would actually take. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think CC basically has to either put his trust in crews and be prepared to lose a, a bit of money, or this could be some sort of a game changer where we see CC lose a substantial amount of money. Mm-hmm. Or CC could refuse to do it, and Cruz, you know, says, well, I can't work for someone who would put money ahead of other people's lives. Yeah, that's another possibility. Now, Peter is about to fire at Joe, and there was no earthquake, and there was no, no Ginger Jones. No. There was just a glint from the rifle sight, yeah. a glint of sunlight, which Joe detected, and he dove to the ground just as uh, Peter fired at him. Yeah. 
So um, he starts to run, and then after a couple more shots, he realizes, oh my god, someone's actually shooting at me. This wasn't just an, you know, a weird error. This is yeah. someone's after me. This wasn't like someone out hunting or something, and mm-hmm. they, you know, accidentally... Yeah, so, yeah. so um, Joe doubles back a little bit, and then at one point he's above uh, the trail that he was previously on, and he sees that it's Peter. Yeah. And I oh. think at that point he knows, you know, Peter's trying to kill him. He knows, him. yeah. So, um, uh, thanks to all the dry leaves all over the place, uh, Peter hears him and, and is able to catch up to him mm-hmm. again. Um, Peter reloads and shoots a few more times, and at one point... Joe goes down after a shot. And, yeah. Uh, Peter comes up to him and prods him with the rifle, but Joe's just been playing uh, playing dead, and he grabs the rifle out of yeah. Peter's hand. He aims it at him, and Peter starts to laugh because he took the bullets out first. Right. And then Peter takes out his pistol. Uh-huh. So Joe sits down on a log while Peter... James Bond villain Lee yes, explains Yes, well, he that, talks too much. You know, oh, well, Kelly, yeah, it's all about Kelly, you know, I loved her, but it looks like she loves you a bit more than she loves me, and I'm the one who planted cocaine in your bike, and, uh, and I knew you were innocent the whole time. So again, so how this did he know this? throws off Joe, but, uh, just as, um, um, oh, yeah, so I forgot that earlier, um, the park ranger had heard the gunshots early on, yeah. uh, and had called for reinforcements. Uh, so, uh, and then also Kelly had talked to Dominic and found out that Dominic hadn't sent the note. Mm-hmm. So Kelly had rushed out as well. So by the time uh, Peter and Joe end up on this log, Kelly has shown up and yeah. she's calling Joe's name, and uh, Peter's distracted by that, and Joe quickly throws a handful of of dirt from under the log he's sitting on mm-hmm. into Peter's face, and uh, Kelly shows up as the two of them are grappling. So she sees, you know, Peter and Joe, yeah, and Peter holding the gun, and they they lose their footing and start rolling down a hill, you know, wrapped around each other, and suddenly there's a gunshot. Yeah, because one of them still has the gun. So yeah. you know, whenever you see people in a fight like this. And someone grabbing a gun, you know that gun's going to be fired, and someone's going to be hurt or killed. Mm-hmm. So now we happened three times in the last two weeks on yeah. days of our lives, but yeah. <laughs> but at least this rolling down a hill added something to it. Exactly. Know? So we don't know yet if someone has been hurt or someone has been killed, or maybe the shot went off into a tree. Who knows? Um, so we don't know quite what's happened with this shot. What do you think has happened? Well, if uh, Peter has been hurt or killed, then Joe will know for sure. Like, I mean, he already knows he didn't do it. Mm -hmm. But that gives a whole other angle to his investigation. The fact that Peter knew doesn't mean Peter necessarily did it. He would be their first suspect. Yeah, yeah. So that gives a whole other angle to this. Um, If if it's Joe who is shot or killed, then Peter can sort of shuffle out of the the bush and say that he he would probably say that Joe attacked him. Um, He would probably. Obviously, he wouldn't be telling people that he knew. Mm-hmm. But Kelly knows that Peter lured him out there. Yeah. So, Peter's got the gun, though, but one would hope that he wouldn't hold it on Kelly, because that would mess everything up. So, yeah, his only hope is to talk talk his way into saying that Peter, that Joe attacked him, and, and I don't know, maybe he did lure Joe out there, but just to have a chat or something. Yeah. I don't know. It would be a hard. It'll be a hard sell. I think. I think another possibility, um, if they really want to make use of that location a little more, would be if Joe is, is, incapacitated in some way, and Peter, takes Kelly, prisoner. Mm. And then Joe's if like he's really trying to chase unhinged. after him. And yeah, and, and you could sort of. Picture that. Mm-hmm. Or what if the bullet hit Kelly? Mm. 
If it bounced off a tree and hit Kelly, maybe. Mm-hmm. The forest ranger shouldn't be too far away. I and mean, then like, if if Joe was incapacitated, or even if he wasn't, Peter could say, oh, Joe just shot Kelly. That's true, too. If she got hit in the head, she could have amnesia and still end up marrying Peter. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. I think it would be a waste to have the shot and not have hit anyone. Yeah. But uh, who it could hit, that's a good question. There's different the, ways it could go. And and we've heard Peter twice now say, oh, I know Joe is innocent. Mm -hmm. He's told Ginger. Mm -hmm. He's told Joe. And he's told Joe. Now what's Ginger going to do with it? Well, you know, we can think of some scenarios where she might be able to use that information. If she's trying to bargain with She could with try to get Kelly to pay her yeah. some money. Yeah. You know, or something like that. Um, but it's kind of interesting to think what Joe would use that information for. I mean, Ginger could maybe look for some evidence at Joe's apartment. Maybe mm -hmm. he's got a journal, too, now that she knows that she's yeah. looking for some something. So. Yeah. Yeah, I think if Peter died, it would be a bit too soon. Yeah. Because he's still got this information. Yeah. And it's not really going to help anyone just to know that, because Joe already knew he was innocent. Yeah, yeah. So I think Peter's got to be alive, but whether he's shot or not, that's another. That's a different question. Maybe he'll go into a coma, and they'll be like, oh, Peter knows who did it. You know, we just got to wait for him to come out of a coma. I just, I just think if Peter survives at all, he's going to do something duplicitous. Like if Joe's passed out or whatever, he'll find a way to, I, I really can see him saying, oh, Joe attacked me, or, mm -hmm. you know. I don't know. And then the other thing is, if Joe survives, Kelly still needs to keep that fact from the police, right? So she might have to cover for Peter for a few days until mm -hmm. Mason drops the other charges. That might also, if if Peter comes out of this alive, that might also be something he holds over her. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hmm. It's going to be exciting. Yeah. Well, you know how it all winds down, but I don't I, know. So. I don't remember. I don't remember what, it was a long what happens time here. I, I had, when I saw it, I had vague memories of people wandering around in the desert. Uh, so that must be these scenes that, you know, or maybe the next few days, too, of people uh, of people in the what I thought was a desert, but wildlife reserve. I guess California is a desert anyway. So it's, It looks dry and brushy. It I remember one other desert. desert thing that happens um, in the next couple of weeks, but um, other than that, I don't remember how any of this plays out. I mean, obviously I know who lives and who dies, but... Over the course of the show. Over the too. course of the show, yeah. But uh, how the entire series wraps up in ten years? I'm I mean, sure someone could get shot multiple times over the course of a show and not be dead. So that happens all the time. Mm -hmm. It happened to Mannix quite a lot on Mannix. Mm -hmm. so. All right, that is the end of oh the week. We're at the end of week. I want to say fifteen. Wow, that's great. Or am I wrong? Oh, no, we still have an episode. We are one episode away from the end of week 15. So we will be back after we watch episode 75. And there's probably be, going to be a cliffhanger, not like we haven't had a cliffhanger every day this week. Yes, and we'll know the answer to the question we've just been pondering. We hope. We hope they don't like go a whole day without showing any of those people. yeah maybe they'll just spend the that whole day on the locker terrible. gels or something it'll be all mr bottoms tomorrow <laughs> it'll be all, mr. Bottoms. all right see you in a minute no four seconds bye welcome back hello we've finished episode 75 uh which aired on november 9th 1984 mm-hmm <laughs> Warren tells Augusta that he got the coin from Kelly and the others, which is odd because he previously said he'd gotten rid of all the others. And now he's like, oh yeah, I got all the others and the one from Kelly. So that's 
It seems like he was saving all the coins until he found that one last coin, and then he's maybe decided to dispose of them all together? Yeah. He's really not, you know, doing a really good job with these coins, although now he's switched from carrying them around in a metal box to a little tiny cloth bag, more like uh, what a pirate would have, I guess. A sensible person, of course, would have buried them somewhere five years ago. Mm-hmm. I mean, if he had buried all the others and just gotten the one from Kelly, he could have thrown that in the ocean or something and mm -hmm. been done with it. Yeah. Since he works at the ocean. Yeah, it would have been kind of easy. <laughs> so. I mean, so far he's had them in his old bedroom. He's had them... Uh, in his locker at, at the beach. He's had them all uh, over the floor at work. Yeah. He's had them all over the floor in the family living room. He had them jangling around in his pocket, which is how he lost one in the presidential suite to begin with. Yeah. Um, Augusta has asked him to check on the horses, maybe take one, take them out for a ride because they're getting a bit antsy. Mm -hmm. Probably because there's an earthquake a coming. Now, this is a bit foreboding because. We remember Cruz basically um, mentioning to someone, I can't remember who it was, mm -hmm. uh, not to go out near the horses because even though they're spooked, like this would not be a good time to ride mm. horses during an earthquake. So that's not a good sign. So, of course, Ted comes to the door because he's been chasing Warren, mm -hmm. and Warren ducks out the French doors that go to the side, and Ted basically runs around the side of the house. So uh, he runs into Warren in the stables, where stores where Warren's been getting uh, his horse ready, and they argue. Yeah. Ted says, "You killed my brother." Warren punches him out. Warren takes off with a horse. Ted wakes up, grabs a saddle, saddles up another horse, and they spend the episode chasing after each other uh, on the outback of the Lockridge property, which seems to be just as big as the uh, Capwell property. Yeah, and, and there's some great uh, sh shots that have been done on location, obviously, and they're riding through this sort of ravine, and uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it's... it's I think great. these might be the desert shots that I remember, because yeah. that looks much more deserty than the wildlife refuge. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I also have to say, um, I, I thought that they did a really good job, you know, even during the indoor scenes, for example, um... When we see, you know, Ted having this conversation at the door, we can see in in the background the uh, foliage moving. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We can see it through the French doors. Yeah, it's, it's and these windy. weird winds keep coming up throughout the episode, and we can see the leaves yeah. blowing. Yeah. Back at the wildlife refuge, Peter and Joe are rolling down a hill. The gun goes off. Peter stands up and then promptly falls over because he's been shot in the stomach. Yeah. Uh, two police arrive, recognize Joe, and arrest him. Mm -hmm. Kelly doesn't really protest that much because she's, you know, worried about saving Joe, uh, mm -hmm. saving Peter. Yeah. Because he is bleeding. Paramedics. One of the cops says, uh, "Oh, he's lost a lot of blood already before the paramedics even get there." Mm -hmm. um, Kelly rides with Peter in the ambulance, um, and she very quickly tries to turn the conversation to. Tell me what you know about the night Channing died. Yeah. So yeah. that's her main reason for riding in there with Peter. Yeah. Um, he's quite delirious. He does start telling the story. Oh, Channing was so happy when I told him that you and Joe were going to elope. Yeah. Um, well, so happy to hear the news. So that yeah, he he's glad it. someone had told And him. then, but then he peters out. He doesn't really say anything new that we don't know. No. And then he kind of passes out. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we think wait, maybe we've, we've lost him. Mm -hmm. he, he's obviously in very critical condition. I suspect we'll be seeing days and days of him in the hospi hospital passing out just before he can say anything. Yeah, probably. <laughs> John and Marissa are just on their way out to the door, out the door to their cruise when the phone rings and it's Joe saying he's been arrested. Yeah. So they are gonna. They're not gonna make that cruise. So much for their second honeymoon. Now, um, Cruz Castillo. Uh, and Mason are hanging around at the Capwell mm -hmm. house. And, uh, Cruz says there's going to be an earthquake. Yeah. Uh, Rosa comes in and says, Joe's been found alive and Peter Flint's been shot. 
Mason quickly calls the office and, uh, you know, gets the info. Oh, yes, uh, Joe had a gun and a rifle mm -hmm. is the news that comes back. So Mason tells them to revoke his parole immediately and send him yeah. to prison. Uh, Kelly demands that he release Joe, and he refuses. And uh, she says, well, I hate you, and I hate, see your da I hate Dad for what you've done to Joe. I think she does make a good point, and this point has been made to Mason by other people as well. Uh, Cruz has certainly pointed it out a few times, is that Mason tends to take these actions without actually investigating anything. She says, oh, you don't arrest people be because they're guilty or not guilty. You arrest them because you, you don't like them. Mm -hmm. so, uh, Augusta finds out, of course, and says... Um, uh, Joe, uh, Joe's alive. I, I wonder why he would have shut Peter. He could have killed us in our beds. Mm -hmm. And Lionel says, interesting choice of locales. You could have said the garden. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, earlier when Augusta and Lionel were arguing about his potential affairs during that Bible scene, um, when he goes to swear on the Bible, she... She asked if he's having an affair, and then she said, with anyone in Santa Barbara. Mm -hmm. And that includes Montecito. You're not getting out of this on a technicality. <laughs> so, um, then John shows up at the police station, tells Joe, oh, I know a good lawyer, and we're not, I'm not going to abandon you this time. Yeah. Um, Joe, Kelly comes in, Joe says, I think my best bet is for you to find Dominic, because maybe if Dominic comes forward, yeah. we can, like, short-circuit this. So, um, Joe gets put into a police car, and he's on a very, the fugitive-like ride back to prison. Yeah. I don't know, if something could happen to that police car, Joe might be able to escape. Yeah. Uh, the police are very taunting, too, so... They're not the kind of guys you'd want to rescue if, let's say, no. a car went off well, a ravine or something. Well, they're obviously taking their cue from Mason and, I, I guess, the DA's office, their attitude towards this. They don't mm -hmm. seem to expect to be disciplined in any way for, for taunting their prisoner. Mm-hmm. The one guy says, ah, oh, we knew you'd be back in jail soon. Now, Santana is packing her suitcase to go to Rio with Brandon. Um, Brandon wakes up from a nightmare and wants his mother. Yeah. So uh, she sees how much he misses Gina, and they phone Gina, and Brandon is talking to her, and she sees yeah. how much Brandon loves Gina as a mother. Then Cece arrives, very annoyed that Santana and Brandon are alone. Yeah. Um, sees her suitcase and says, oh, are you planning to take off? And she said, no, I just got back from Nice, but of course she was packing it. She was, yeah. And, um... She goes up to get Brandon. She says, well, let's find out from Brandon if she wants to stay with me. Mm -hmm. And while she's outside, uh, the phone rings, and it's the travel agent, and Cece takes a message. So she comes be uh, back in, and he confronts her about, uh, oh, your two tickets to Rio are ready. <laughs> so she says, oh, I'd already changed my mind about going to Rio. Yeah. And he says, he insists Brandon is coming home with him, and he tries to grab her out of uh, grab him out of her arms, but she won't release him. And then Mason arrives. Yeah. So that's how things are at the Andrade house. Now, we don't actually um, hear much of the conversation that Mason has when he gets there, do we? I mean, we don't hear him tell CC any of the story. No, no. And uh, there may not be time, considering what happens next. So, the episode starts with Bree sitting at the base of Minx's sarcophagus, which yep. is now in the living room, and suddenly Bree jumps up, kind of unsettled. Yeah. Uh, and then throughout the episode, Bree is very antsy, just like the horses. Yeah. Um, Lionel is outraged by Augusta's accusation, and uh, makes and uh, says he's going to swear on the family Bible mm -hmm. um, that he is not having an affair with Eden. Yeah. I'm just going to read go over the other thing again then because I thought we'd already done it. Um, so Augusta gets him to swear um, and she says specifically asks if he's having an affair with anyone in Santa Barbara mm -hmm. and that includes Montecito mm -hmm. and then she and then he says uh, well uh, he gives a big range oh uh, I'm not having an affair with anyone from San Diego yeah, County yeah. all the way up to wherever. 
So then uh, he tries to turn that on her and gets tries to get her to swear on the Bible. I'm not, mm -hmm. I can't quite figure out what he was going to try and get her to swear to. Um, but uh, she refuses to. Um, and then Lionel goes to Sophia's grave and uh, says, you know, you know, I know that I'm not going to, you know, have an affair with Eden and that uh, I can't really make anything up to you about what happened and I love Augusta. So I think what I'm going to just do is tell Eden everything, explain why I've been acting, you know, like this to get it out of my system. Which seems to be a good idea, I think. Mm -hmm. um, Eden is still in Peter's office, and Amy comes in, and she basically has to confess that she's Joe's sister because she's trying to tell her the news that Joe's been found and mm -hmm. Peter Flint's been shot, and they suspect yeah. Joe. Um, Lionel shows up to ask Eden to meet him, and uh, they agree to meet at the cemetery in half an hour. At the cemetery, he tells her that, you know, someone left a mask in a bathing suit and he thought it was her, but she said, no, that wasn't mm -hmm. me. And he said, yeah, I thought you were haunting me. Uh, and then he says, I have to tell you uh, stuff about your mother. And he starts to tell her about uh, how he first met Sophia in L.A. when she was working on a movie. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, just then Augusta arrives and she takes one look at them and turns around to leave. So Lionel goes after her. Yeah. And then we see Augusta standing on a, a cliff, and then from another angle we see she's on a road, so she's like at the edge of a road, yeah, so near a little cliff, kind of like the cliff Sarah Jane Smith rolled down in The Five Doctors, I think. Um, but anyway, she's at the top of what may well be a cliff uh, when the earthquake starts. So we surmise that, you know, Augusta got really upset when she saw Lionel with Eden, especially after having this conversation with him before. And I assume just jumped into her car, drove away, and then maybe was was really overcome with emotion, maybe maybe uh, stopped her car by the side of the road to, to get out and contemplate things or pull herself together. That's what I'm surmising happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. That, that graveyard has some... Uh... Looks like it has some pillars in it that I don't think I've really, no, you know, quite tweaked to because we've only ever seen it in the dark, and now it's suddenly the bright yeah. day, the clock said four twenty one and uh, or four twenty two something mm -hmm. like that in Cruz's and Professor John's uh, seismic lab. Yeah. Um, so it's the middle of the day, and we finally see, get a nice bright shot of the cemetery. I'm all, well, it's nice to see, you know, be able to read. What's on the gravestone, so we could also see the backdrop was clearly a painting. Yeah, which had yeah. always been shrouded in darkness and fog and and uh, things like that. That was maybe a set they saved a little bit of money on because, you know, as we've said with some of the other sets, especially when you look out through the French doors at the from the Lockridge living room, you always seem to see a sort of living backdrop. So. Mm -hmm. And I guess from those early scripts. You know, of course, you're going to assume all the graveyard scenes are going to be at night. Yeah, of course. Of course. So, but uh, it's kind of fun to see it mm -hmm. all, mm -hmm. all lit up like that. It actually seems smaller now than than originally when you couldn't really see how far yes. it extended yeah. into Yeah, I into think the darkness and shadows really helped to give it a bit of, of depth and, and gave it a little bit of the illusion of being this vast space. Mm-hmm. So what do we think the earthquake will do? Well, let's see. Um, Peter, we assume, is safely safely in hospital. Mm -hmm. So unless the roof of the hospital caves in, there's he's probably not going to be overly affected by it. Um, but yeah, certainly anyone in, you know, who's out in the world. So right now Joe is in a police car on mm -hmm. the road, so yeah, that car could roll over. Or, it's and, very reminiscent of the yeah. fugitive. I, I, I can't imagine that that car is not going to yeah. go off the road and he's going to maybe rescue the two injured police officers and then take off on his own. I think Warren and Ted could be in some difficulty. They're on their yeah. horses. They're on their horses. They're in, in a like canyon. canyon. There could be rock slides or anything like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. One I mean, of them may have to end up rescuing the other. Yeah, one something. of them might be trapped under a rock or something. Maybe those coins will finally get buried like they should have been. Yeah, yeah. 
or you know maybe they'll be stranded out there and Ted will get more of the story I mean who knows I, uh, I'm pretty sure Augusta will fall down that cliff yeah I think She's Augusta standing will so fall close to the edge of the down road the cliff. Um, now maybe those pillars in the cemetery will fall over on Lionel and Eden they might get trapped under something too. that's possible for sure um, I'm trying to think where everyone else is uh, I guess Rosa would be at the Capwell house because she wasn't at the Andrade's. So Rosa and Ruben would be there. Lincoln and Minx and Brick, as far as we know, are, are at the Lockridge house. Mm hmm. Yeah, because I guess Lincoln wouldn't be out on the yacht. So. Yeah. Yeah, Minx, Breeze, and uh, yeah, Lincoln are probably home. And Kelly's at the police station. John's um, just left the police station. Marissa yeah. and Amy probably still at. Either Amy's at work Amy's or. Amy's probably at work. Or at and home with Jade Marissa. and Marissa are probably. At home. At home. Unpacking. Uh, we know that Mason and Cece and Santana and Brandon are all are at, at the Andrade Rose's house. Home. Now, Gina might be on the road. And she could be affected. On the road to LA, or she might be safe. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Cruz and the professor are. Are in the seismic lab. Mm -hmm. And what are the cast members? Do we have Brick? It's probably around somewhere. Yeah, uh, Danny's on the probably around somewhere. Property. It's, uh, yeah, they're not, Ted's not at school, so it's either after school or it's a weekend. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, Jade yeah. didn't seem to be at school either, so. Yeah, that's slightly too early for uh, Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I'm not sure what day of the week it is. We don't know what's going on. I mean, the the museum in Santa Barbara, I mean, mm. Summer might have a statue mm -hmm. fall on her. Yeah, or there's, oh, there's lots of artworks in that, yeah. in that thing that could get destroyed. And I can't think of any other cast members off the top of my head. Veronica's safely out of town, we assume. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, well, we'll see if And anyone... we'll find out... W what happens to Dominic? I'm sure Dominic's still around. Yeah, where, like where I would have is. thought Dominic was on the gonna rush to the uh, to the wildlife reserve too. Unless Dominic is may, maybe is out of town, maybe he is in L.A. or somewhere investigating something. Yeah, I don't know where Peter got that back from L.A. stuff. Yeah, from. yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, well, we'll see how many of our cast members find themselves in jeopardy as a result of this earthquake and how it changes things mm -hmm. i mean i imagine it's not going to last for too long i mean assuming it's the big one and not just another tremor mm -hmm. but it can't last more than a few minutes of the episode so to drag it out there got to be people trapped under things for a while you know? yeah i would think so i mean in real life you know a tremor can do an enormous amount of damage in a very very short period of time mm -hmm. Um, whether this is one of those quakes that does that kind of damage. Augusta might fall right on that pack of wild coyotes. Yeah, we still haven't uh, had a payoff. No, we've heard some coyotes. birds chirping in this episode, yeah. but no coyotes. And as we were saying in the last, uh, when we were talking about the last episode, and it's mentioned throughout this, there, there is a lot of... Um, there's a lot built on the fact that the animals are are feeling unease leading mm -hmm. up to this. So it it's not just the horses. It's uh, it's Breeze the dog. It's the silent birds. So there's lots of little ominous warnings of this coming throughout the episode. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm excited about next week to see what havoc the earthquake. Yes, I'm excited too. As we. Return for week 16 of Misha and Diane Watch Santa Barbara. See you. Bye. This week's spotlight is on Margarita Cordova, who played Rosa Andrade on Santa Barbara. Margarita Cordova was born on February 26, 1938, in Guadalajara, Jalisco. In addition to being an actress, Cordova is also a dancer. She has been married to Clark Allen, with whom she operated the El Cid Flamenco Club in Los Angeles. Cordova's first credit is a 1958 episode of Sea Hunt. Before Santa Barbara, she appeared in dozens of series and TV movies such as The Twilight Zone, Peter Gunn, The Man from Uncle, Mission Impossible, The Mod Squad, The Six Million Dollar Man, 
Archie Bunker's Place, and Dallas. Beginning with Episode 1, Cordova appeared in 229 episodes of Santa Barbara as Rosa Andrade, housekeeper and substitute mother to the Capwell family. Her character was phased out in 1987, but when the Dobsons regained control over the show, they brought Rosa back onto the canvas. Cordova is the only cast member to appear in the first and last episodes of Santa Barbara. After Santa Barbara, Cordova made a few more TV appearances, including 184 episodes of the serial Sunset Beach between 1997 and 1999 as Carmen Torres. <laughs> 